Good morning. Thank you for joining the Gabelli Funds live webcast series. I'm your host, Chris Matheson, and today we're joined by the portfolio managers of the Gabelli Growth and Global Growth Funds, Howard Ward and Chris Ward, for discussions surrounding the current state of the economy, an acceleration of the di digital revolution, and how the Gabelli Growth and Global Growth Funds are positioning giving these changing dynamics. Howard Ward, Ward has been at the helm of the Domestic Growth Fund since 1994 and took over managing the now five-star rated Gabelli Global Growth Fund in 2004. Chris Ward is a portfolio manager of both strategies, and Caesar Bryant is the international specialist also working on the global portfolio. Both funds continue to outperform in the last several trailing time periods against their respective benchmarks and peer groups. Year-to-date through last night, the Gabelli Growth Fund, GGCIX, is up 9.5%, outperforming the S&P 500 by 14.1%, and the Gabelli Global Growth Fund, GGGIX, is up 5.6%, outperforming the MSCI ACWI by 12.9%. If you have questions during the presentation, you can enter them at any point in the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. I'd like to now turn the call over to Howard. Good morning, Chris. And Thank you everybody for joining us this morning. I'm gonna to start today's talk with a bit of a macro overview. As some of you may know, um, our macro overview goes into our thinking in terms of the portfolio construction process. It helps us to determine exactly how much beta we wanna to try to dial into the portfolio. So that can affect both the sector weightings as well as some individual issue weightings. But first, um, before we get into the portfolio, let's talk about this economy. Um, some of you may have seen the first quarter actual numbers for GDP. Um, it was negative 5%. Um, second quarter, as you know, is going to be a lot worse. Um, we're sort of figuring down about 40%. Now, these are quarterly numbers that are annualized. So, the actual second quarter might be negative nine, but it's gonna show up in the press annualized as negative 40. I think it was the Atlanta Fed yesterday, one of the regional Fed uh, banks yesterday came out with their estimate of Q2 GDP of negative 53%. So um, this pandemic hit our economy like a tsunami and it just shocked it. When you think about it, we went from the lowest unemployment rate in 60 years to the highest unemployment rate in 90 years over the course of two months. Now, the good news is in the, the second half of this year, we should have a recovery. Um, and we should average around 8% growth in the back half of this year. Now, for the year, it's still going to be a, a very bad, you know, negative 7% kind of number, but right now the estimates for 2021 are looking for 5% growth. You know, that's pretty optimistic uh, considering everything that we've gone through. Now, this of course assumes we avoid a really bad second wave of infections and that risk is real. Um, it assumes that we have a vaccine at some point, I think in the next 12 months, um, there's 123 institutions working on that right now, so let's hope that they can certainly achieve that. But what's created the foundation for this very short, uh, very deep recession, so it was a two-month recession that spanned two quarters, what's, what's created the optimism for this is partly this unprecedented monetary policy response. And the Fed not only has thrown everything at this, they started very quickly. They, they started to move when we only had 100 confirmed cases in the United States. And over the course of the first two weeks of March, they cut rates to zero. That was the process that took 18 months in 08 or 09. And in the matter of six weeks, they increased the size of their balance sheet using quantitative easing by two and a half trillion dollars, something that took them over five years over the period of 2008 to 2013. And this quantitative easing program, it's open-ended. 
Uh, it's going to continue probably through 2022, at which point the estimates are the Fed's balance sheet will be over $11 trillion or two times its maximum size in the, in the wake of the Great Recession. And of course, the Fed's not just buying treasuries and mortgages now, they're buying corporate bonds, including junk, and they're buying municipal securities. The Fed didn't stop with QE, they also established a lending facility to make up to $4 trillion of loans. And the Fed may be accused of trying to bail out the stock market, and in, I'm sure that their liquidity has contributed to the rally we've experienced, but I do believe the Fed's primary goal here is to try to protect small businesses, many of which are bank uh, credit dependent, and small businesses, as you know, employ most of the people in this country. So let's move on to the next slide. Let's look at earnings. <clears throat> the, the earnings in the first quarter of this year down uh, 15%. Uh, second quarter, uh, we're going to be down about 43%. Uh, third quarter, year over year now, down 25%, uh, down 13%. But when you look at the question, you go from down 20% in Q1, down 32% in the, in the bottom here, Q2, and then we get the uptick for that second half recovery, up 39% in Q3 up 15% uh, in Q4. Uh, 2020 overall, uh, the estimate now is about $125 of earnings on the S&P, down 23%. When we, when we began the year, the estimate for this year was uh, $178 per share. The estimate for 2021, this would be that recovery year when GDP is up 5%, shows a 30% gain to get back to 164, but of course that remains well below what was originally expected for this year. Now these are IBIS consensus estimates. Um, so it's not just uh, you know, what we feel, this is sort of the, uh, the markets group think on what's going to happen uh, to earnings. Next slide, please. Now stocks are very cheap relative to interest rates and this is very important to understanding this current rally. Um, some of you may have heard of the so-called Fed model for determining the fair value between stocks and bonds. And of course, there are different kinds of models, but I think this one is very good for looking at this current situation. The Fed model says that bonds and stocks are in equilibrium when the earnings yield on stocks is equivalent to the 10-year treasury yield. Well, the earnings yield on stocks right now, um, using the $164 projected earnings for 2021, S&P around 3,000, although it's closer to 3,100 this morning, gives you an earnings yield on next year's earnings, forward earnings for next year, of 5.5%. And the current treasury yield is 70 basis points. So if you were following the Fed model, I mean, the Fed model would say, well, geez, you know, stocks won't, would be in equilibrium with bonds if yields were as high as 5%. And there's, they're nowhere near that. In fact, the spread between the 10-year Treasury yield and the forward earnings yield in the market is, is historic. This is unprecedented. The other way to look at this is from a current income perspective. Typically, the bonds yield more than stocks. And uh, today, the dividend yield on the S&P is around 2%. You know, three times uh, the yield of the 10-year treasury, three times. So we had a situation in 09 where the dividend yield on, on stocks became higher than the 10-year treasury yield. Of course, the 10-year treasury yield wasn't 0 0.7 at the time, it was more like 3%. Um, and the, the inversion didn't last that long. And the Last time it had happened prior to 09, this had not happened since 1957. So this is highly unusual to have stocks yielding more than bonds and not by 20 or 30 basis points, but by a factor of three. If you're an asset allocator and you have 40% uh, 
50%, 35% in your portfolio in bonds. And interest rates are the lowest in the history of mankind. And prospects for getting any sort of a positive real return out of, out of current rates are not very high. You would need to be reallocating your cash flow in the direction of stocks or private equity or some other alternative investment out of bonds. Unless, of course, you don't think we're going to have a vaccine and you think we're going to have something bordering a depression and deflation. Under those circumstances, you might get a capital gain in your bond from here. But I don't think that's the most likely outcome. Uh, to me, right here, there really is no alternative to stocks. Next slide, please. So um, I'm sure you know gross stocks are trading at a premium. They have uh, generally outperformed the value side of the market for most of the last uh, 10 years. Not every year, but certainly uh, over the uh, complete time period. Um, so the question is, are the premium valuations uh, sustainable? So let's look at this and think about this for a minute. Uh, we just reviewed how interest rates have never been this low in history. And that means the present value of future cash flows has never been higher. Never. Um, so that provides certainly some support for premium valuations. We also have a scarcity of growth compared to what we've had historically. Um, by that I mean, if you were to look at the S&P 500 today, you would see there's about 50 companies out of the 500 that have top line growth of 15% or higher. And if you went back to 1999, you would have found about 165 stocks uh, that had top line growth uh, in excess of 15%. So, so growth itself, high growth, high organic growth has become more scarce and that helps to support the premium valuations for those that really have it. And investors have shown a preference uh, during this cycle of paying up for growth, uh, stability, profitability, and strong balance sheets. Strong balance sheets, has, you know, it's one of those things that investors always talk about. It's usually not an issue. Well, it's, it became a real issue in the last few months as companies that have uh, weak balance sheets have suffered quite a bit uh, during the turmoil of the pandemic. Some companies, as you know, have filed for uh, Chapter 11. So you have to ask yourself, um, knowing about this pandemic, knowing that there is some probability that we'll have another pandemic somewhere down the line. We don't know when, we didn't know about this one, but it's probably gonna happen again at some point. So to me, it would be perfectly logical for those companies that are growing right through this, the so-called pandemic proof stocks, to have a re-rating at a higher level and those companies that are casualties of the pandemic, and we all know who those companies are and in those industries, that they would suffer a re-rating lower. In other words, in a normal environment, the normalized PE on the pandemic proof stocks should be higher than it was, and the normalized PE on the casualties of the pandemic should be lower. Next slide, please. So, we talked about the low rates, and um, low rates are a function of various things, and one of them, of course, is um, slow growth. If you go back um, over the last uh, 10 years, 11 years, this current expansion, we had an average compound growth rate of GDP of 2.2%. Just keep that in mind. I've already mentioned how we transitioned from nearly record low unemployment to record high in two months. We have an unemployment rate um, that's probably 18% in May. For some perspective in the Great Depression, that number was 25%. And the peak in 2009 was barely 10%. A number of businesses are going to disappear. A number of people who have filed for unemployment are probably going to discover that 
the jobs that they thought they were furloughed from are no longer going to exist once the economy is, is fully opened up. So a number of businesses are going to disappear. We are having a record, we're going to have a record this year of debt to GDP. And typically when that happens, that's followed by a period of deleveraging. <clears throat> so we have an environment here where the unemployment rate is going to be high. Businesses are going to disappear. We're going to have to deleverage. We're going to be looking at lower profits. And lower profits are significant because profits are the source of employment, investment, and productivity. Everything flows from profits. And lower profits will also reduce dividends. We're seeing that already. It will cut back on buybacks, and it will result in less M&A. So the slower growth of the last 11 years is likely going to continue. We can have an economy that has a cyclical spurt where we can grow at 5% next year as people from the, uh, rejoin the workforce. But the sustainable level of growth is going to remain down around 2%. This is a function of demographics. It's a macro problem. It's a labor force growing at, at one half of 1% a year. It's productivity growth that has unable, been unable to average more than about 1.4% a year over the last decade. So it's going to be very hard to have sustainable growth above 2%. In the 1990s, it wasn't hard. In the 1990s, we had seven years of GDP growth in excess of 3%. We haven't had 3% growth since 2004, by the way. And in the 1990s, we had five of those seven years, we had growth in excess of 4%. We had better demographics then. Next slide, please. So continuing with, with this, this theme of slower sustainable growth is from a policy standpoint, the current policy, the emergency policy, to address the pandemic has been very stimulative. Not only the fiscal policy, but the, I mean, the, not only the monetary policy, but fiscal policy too. We've approved $3 trillion in, in grants. About half of that has been dispersed. There probably will be another trillion dollars approved when all is said and done. But after the bounce, and when we get through this very difficult time, we're looking at, again, headwinds to growth. Escalating tensions with China. I mean, just today, uh, disallowing direct flights on Chinese airlines into the United States. Um, we need to look at. We need to expect higher taxes at the federal, state, and local levels. Tax revenue is not up to snuff, obviously, because of the pandemic. There's going to be an uh, attempt to uh, come to grips with that with the budgets. It's going to result in, in higher taxes at the upper ends, uh, certainly. A change in control of the White House in favor of Joe Biden, uh, I think, will will certainly uh, address this. And it's likely not just to be about the budget. It's going to be about addressing the income inequality, which is being highlighted every day right now um, on the streets of our big cities. Immigration restrictions have tightened. This is another uh, headwind to growth. Um, and we should expect uh, greater regulation as well. Um, some of this is going to be to claw back the changes that have occurred under Donald Trump's uh, presidency. Of course, this would be assuming that Donald Trump uh, is not reelected, and we don't know if that's going to be the case or not. But I would argue that either way, I think the public is going to be anxious about uh, climate change. We know this is a, a looming, uh, significant global problem, and we probably need to do more to address that uh, rather than continue to kick that down the road. You know, remember the fact that the pandemic um, had people like Bill Gates talking about it five years ago. Uh, nobody really paid attention to it. And uh, science is telling us about climate change, and we've done some. We need to do more to try to combat that because that's going to be. Uh, a very real problem for the world um, at some point in the not too distant future as well. And finally, while I believe we will have a vaccine and we will have that within 12 months, um, there's no certain certainty on the timing of that. Um, so maybe it's dangerous to assume that we're gonna have that vaccine within that time frame. Historically, it's taken us nine years to develop a vaccine. So, um, 
this is different. We are throwing everything at this. I do think with modern technology, we will be successful, but uh, we are um, making an assumption in terms of the recovery and the ongoing sustainability of the economy that we will have a vaccine. So um, let's go to the, uh, to the next question. I mean, the next slide, sorry. And this has to do with technology. I need to talk about this before I turn the mic over to Chris to talk more about our positioning. And it's important because uh, some of you know, technology is now 40% of the Russell uh, 1000 growth index. It's more than 40% of our portfolios. Um, what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is that technology really is driving uh, the economy. The digital economy, according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, uh, grew at a 7% CAGR um, uh, uh, since 2012 uh, versus uh, GDP's 2% uh, growth. Tech CapEx is almost 50% uh, uh, of total CapEx now. It's it's 47%. Soon it will surpass 50%. Uh, Tech CapEx has grown 82% since 2012 compared to 52% for total CapEx, 52% for total CapEx. Tech industrial production is up 72% since 2012 versus 5% for total industrial production. E-commerce is up 130% over the same period versus 31% for total retail sales. Tech employment growth has doubled total employment growth at 31% versus 15%. So at a, a, a more like than at any time in history, technology is driving employment. It's, it's beginning to drive industrial production and, and, and CapEx. And we think this trend is only going to continue. At this point, I'm going to turn the mic over to Chris so he can talk more about our portfolio positioning. Great, thank you. Um, I also want to thank everyone for joining today. So my objective, um, and Chris, you can start with my first slide. My objective is today is to talk through some of the acceleration we are seeing across the digital landscape. Um, COVID-19 has served as a, fo a force function to expose consumers to new behaviors, whether that is shopping for groceries online or streaming video at home. The chart in front of you is one we've shown before. Um, this is a visual representation of how we think about the secular growth themes that we have exposure to. There are some obvious overlaps here. Uh, many of these verticals are interdependent. Many companies play in multiple verticals. But just to lay the groundwork, these are some of the trends that were already in place prior to COVID-19, and many of which are accelerating as a result of shelter in place. So we can go to the next slide. We've seen surge demand across digital properties of all flavors. Um, you can see here in some parts of the world, internet traffic is up nearly 50% from pre-COVID levels. And you've probably heard about the surge in applications that enable remote work, including Zoom, which we are using right now, but from an investment perspective, our objective has been to distinguish consumption trends that might be fleeting from more meaningful key performance indicators that might be indicative of long-term sustainable trends. Um, now at this juncture, it is still early. Um, data is changing every day by the week. And we want to be careful how much we extrapolate certain trends, but we do wanna connect as many dots as possible by focusing on key performance indicators across the digital landscape. So starting with e-commerce, it's of no surprise that e-commerce activity has accelerated this year, starting in March with consumers stocking up on essentials. Some of the most recent forecasts, um, such as this you see here, suggests that COVID-19 has pulled, for, pulled forward two to three years of e-commerce adoption. There's recent third-party data that shows elevated e-com activity continued through May up as much as 50 to 60% year over year. So clearly this current level of activity will be hard to, to sustain once consumers go back to work, but there are some important developments that we think will be longer lasting. And that would be number one, COVID-19 has brought new shoppers into the e-commerce e ecosystem. So PayPal called out 
older demographics as being the fastest growing cohort on the platform. These are people still relatively new to the e-commerce experience. And then Amazon is seeing a surge in new Prime members in the US, which is all the more impressive considering there are already over 100 million Prime members in the US. And this is a metric that has significance for lifetime value because Prime members historically have spent more over time and spend on average twice that of a non-Prime member. And then in addition to new shoppers, we can go back one, sorry, Chris. In addition to new shoppers coming online, we are seeing new categories of spend coming online, most notably grocery, which is an $800 billion TAM that has historically been stuck in an online penetration rate in the lowest single digits. There are estimates out there suggesting online grocery was up between 50 and 100% year over year in Q1, even though there was only less than a month of impact. And there are estimates that Amazon saw 50 times their typical increase in orders. So here we have some survey data that shows over 40% of respondents tried online grocery for the first time during COVID. So again, we don't need that whole 40% to continue shopping for online groceries at this pace. Even if only a portion of those consumers develop an online grocery shopping habit, I might be one of them, we'll see a step change in the adoption. So moving to electronic payments, electronic payments are facing headwinds from weak consumer spending in verticals like travel and hospitality, which has especially weighed on their highly profitable cross-border volumes. However, there are some factors working as offsets that actually might prove to be long-term sustainable trends as we exit COVID. So the long-term structural thesis on electronic payments is the conversion of cash and check to card and digital forms of payment. Still today, over 50% of global consumer to business volumes are completed in cash and check. E-commerce, which we just discussed, is an important driver of cash to card conversion. Contact list, which means using an RFID enabled credit card or NFC enabled mobile phone to make appointment, a payment at point of sale. And then there's the potential for new payment flows to be digitized, such as B2B, disbursements and benefit payments made all the more important with the recent government issued stimulus checks. So with regard to the e-commerce vertical specifically, here's a quick case study using data from PayPal's most recent earnings call. PayPal added 250,000 net new actives every day, per day in April, versus the pre-COVID rate of about 100,000. Additionally, new user engagement, which the company defines as three or more transactions within the first 10 days, is up 30% versus pre-COVID levels. And this metric has a high correlation with customer lifetime value. And then lastly, PayPal is finding that even in countries that have relaxed restrictions, such as Austria and Germany, growth rates are sustaining at levels two to three times prior to COVID. So these KPIs are all supportive of long-term sustainable strength in digital payments. Now moving to the physical point of sale, contactless has, sent, has seen tremendous acceleration as consumers have developed an aversion to touching cash for sanitary reasons. Here's a picture of the New York City subway with recently installed tap and go payment features at the turnstiles. So not only do systems like this offer speed and convenience, but this also allows riders to avoid touching a ticket machine. So the card networks have been communicating that contactless adoption is accelerating. MasterCard recently reported a full 78% of all MasterCard transactions in Europe are now contactless. 81% of those surveyed cited cleanliness as the reason for permanent contactless adoption. And 17% surveyed are no, long, no longer using any cash at all. Uh, similarly, Visa reported 150% year-on-year growth in contactless in March. And importantly, they disclosed previously that contactless payments drive a 20% transaction lift in mature markets. So again, these are KPIs that are supportive of long-term sustainable tailwinds for cash to card conversion. Moving to digital banking, similar theme here, consumers avoiding cash, avoiding physical bank branches, conducting more banking online or on mobile, paying bills online, things like that. In a recent survey conducted by FIS, um, on the next slide here, 45% uh, of bank respondents reported changing the way they interacted with their bank. 
Importantly, that number included 46% of baby boomers. So another example that older demos are adopting digital tools. And FIS also saw a two-fold surge in first-time mobile banking users. Separately, a recent survey from BCG shows 24% of bank customers planning to use branches less or stop using them completely, 44% of millennials in Generation Z enrolled in online and mobile banking for the first time. And again, we think the important takeaway here is that new cohorts are being introduced to digital ecosystems, experiencing the ease and efficiency that they offer, and at least some of this is likely to stick. So moving to the digital ad space, uh, given the decline in brick and mortar traffic, brands are redirecting ad dollars to digital channels to complete conversion. That being said, of course, advertising is a cyclical business um, and advertising verticals such as travel and hospitality have been under strain. Here, uh, Q1 results for Facebook showed an increase in engagement and time spent and therefore impression growth in the 30s. But due to the pullback in ad spending, the net result was a drop in ad prices in the ad auction. However, there were some dynamics under the hood that we did not fully appreciate going into earnings. So on the next slide, here you'll see ad revenue dollars against year-on-year -year growth rates for the major platforms. Obviously, the law of large numbers is a big factor here, uh, but most interesting has been the contrast between Facebook and Google search. So Facebook had a stronger Q1, growing 17% versus 9% for Google search. Um, but more importantly, the growth rates exiting March were even more of a contrast. Google search exited March down in the mid-teens, while Facebook exited March flat year over year. And when we look across the ecosystem and compare results across Snapchat, Twitter, YouTube, and others, the common underlying theme has been those platforms with more direct response advertising have performed much better. Direct response advertising is an ad that is intended to drive an immediate action. So for example, a limited time offer on an e-commerce product or an app install for a video game. And what has happened is despite the declines in travel and hospitality, the beneficiaries of shelter in place, um, like e-commerce and video game platforms, have stepped in to backfill some of the void by taking advantage of the attractive ROI from the drop in ad prices. So going forward, the point being, we think there's gonna be a lot more focus on direct response advertising. So streaming video, um, consumers are stuck at home and they're binging on streaming video Tiger King was not my favorite, but maybe I was the outlier of the 64 million people who watched it. Uh, here on the next slide, we can see that through April, the streaming audience has more than doubled year over year. Now focusing on Netflix as the SVOD proxy, Netflix, Netflix had a blowout first quarter, adding more than double its original guidance for paid net ads. Disney Plus, just months after launching, has nearly met the low end of their five-year target, now with 55 million subs. Now, there's certainly a degree of pull forward here, and Netflix admitted this much on their earnings call. But that being said, there are still long-term implications of this subscriber surge. So one, that pull forward is still accretive to net present value, all else equal. But two, if we assume churn levels have come down during shelter in place, which is a reasonable assumption, because churn becomes a bigger part of the paid net ad equation as the company gets bigger, we think you'll continue to see strong paid net ads for the first foreseeable future. But most importantly, the relative competitive positioning for Netflix has gotten even stronger as Netflix has seen a revenue surge at the same time competitors are dealing with declining TV ad revenue, which makes Netflix more powerful in their ability to invest in content and technology relative to the competitor set. And this is the sort of virtuous cycle that will continue to feed the streaming leaders. And here's the most recent market forecast we have for SVA. And this is why even if some paid net ad growth is pulled forward, it is still contributing to the long-term structural advantage of the streaming leaders. I'm actually gonna close my window, I apologize. All right, so on to video games. Video games have become a safe channel for kids and adults to engage in collaboration and play during this pandemic. 
And here's some recent stats. Verizon recently reported gaming traffic up 82% from pre-COVID levels. Nokia reporting 400% growth in gaming traffic during business hours, which means uh, kids, if you're listening, you should turn off Fortnite and get back to your remote schooling. And video game sales up 73% year over year. We're long-term bullish on the gaming space, which comprises about half of NVIDIA's revenues. But the one piece of data that we're still looking for that would make us even more bullish is the growth in incremental new gamers since shelter in place. And if we do see evidence of that, that new users are being brought into the ecosystem, that would make us incrementally more bullish. So I think you can have an honest debate about the degree of long-term sustainability of some of these verticals. We are still of the belief that consumer behavior change is very difficult to accomplish, but once accomplished, it is sticky. So we do think we have pulled forward adoption curves for many of these areas, but to be sure there will be some reversion when shelter in place restrictions are relaxed. But one area we are perhaps most confident in long-term sustainability of trends is enterprise software. So digital transformation has become this umbrella term to describe basically the adoption of software throughout all areas of a business, whether that be digital marketing, data analytics, or AI and machine learning. And you can see here, even prior to COVID-19, digital transformation was a top priority for CIOs. And cloud adoption is a major component of digital transformation. As businesses seek greater flexibility, lower total cost of ownership, and security, once viewed as a cloud liability, is increasingly being viewed as a cloud advantage. You can see here, even prior to COVID, the public cloud market had robust tailwinds. So what has changed? Well, according to Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, the company has seen two years worth of digital transformation in the last two months. And it's not just Nadella. We're, we're hearing this from pretty much every management team in the space. Here are two recent surveys, one from uh, Fortune 500 CEOs and another surveying 3,000 IT executives. And the majority of these respondents expect digital transformation initiatives to accelerate. What's become clear is that COVID-19 has exposed some of the shortcomings of legacy IT solutions, particularly as it relates to business continuity and remote work. You can see this quote from Workday's earnings call last week, where Chano Fernandez discussed how ill-prepared so many companies were for this change. And a Band-Aid patchwork approach to IT might have worked when the economy was humming, but shelter in place has really highlighted the importance of having a cloud first approach. And of course, the variable OPEX you get in the cloud is especially attractive in an economic downturn relative to big fixed cost data centers. So even if IT budgets decline this year in totality, which Gartner now expects, cloud and software should garner a high percentage of the total. Uh, you can see here, even with a decline in total IT spend, cloud is expected to grow 19%. Within that, there are areas like cloud-based conferencing growing even faster. So as a percent of total IT spend, cloud is about 10 or 11% penetrated in the US. So there's plenty of runway for growth. These are estimates from Gartner prior to COVID-19, but we do expect cloud penetration to accelerate from here. It won't be perfectly linear, but it will have a steeper trajectory than prior to COVID-19. Unlike things like e-commerce and digital payments, where you can see transaction trends in real time, an acceleration in the bigger enterprise software contracts isn't something that will show up in Q1 or even Q2 bookings. This story will take many, many quarters, many years even to unfold. So in summary, in summary here's a snapshot of our portfolio positioning relative to the verticals we just discussed. And I should point out across the strategies, we have about 40% weighted to technology, but more like 60 to 70% exposure to the TMT space overall. And just to re reiterate, the situation is obviously very fluid and every statistic I just shared could be completely outdated by the time the market closes today. But, but based on our best assessment, we think that all the names shown here are well positioned structurally in the near term and long term as adoption curves accelerate. And I'll leave it at that and hopefully we can open it up for Q&A.
Yep. Thank you, Chris, uh, very much for that. Uh, as a reminder, you can enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have a couple questions that came in uh, prior. Um, this one, first one's from Howard in Illinois. Is, is 5G enabling the, crowd, the cloud to grow exponentially? So I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so uh, the, the potential use cases for 5G down the road are are definitely exciting. And I think most people think of 5G being the big unlock for internet of things, which will contribute to growth in big data, data analytics and AI and machine learning. But, but really it's, it's still very early innings for the deployment of 5G. And right now, the primary driver of cloud growth is still, honestly, it's, it's a lot of low hanging fruit. So number one, you have billions of dollars sitting in on-prem servers and legacy ERP systems. Uh, we showed a slide with cloud penetration of total IT spend sitting at just 10%. Right now there's an estimated 25% of existing enterprise workloads sitting in the cloud. That's expected to reach 50% in just two and a half years. And that number doesn't include all the new workloads being built natively on the cloud. Um, and I think we actually showed this in a slide in a previous webcast, but the number of unique software applications is compounding at 12% per year. And the majority of those are being built natively on cloud infrastructure. Um, so really to answer the question, I think 5G is a longer term, very exciting play, especially once autonomous vehicles hit the road. Uh, but right now it's just all about low hanging fruit. Uh, this next question is from Andrew in Oklahoma. How are you thinking about cyclicals versus defensives, uh, especially with PMI showing sequential improvement from a low base? Sure, I will take that, uh, Chris. Um, it's a great question. Now, um, let's just review for a moment that the stock market rally that we're experiencing uh, has seen the S&P now climb over 40% from its, its low. It's the strongest bounce off of the low in history. And a number of the more cyclical names that were very attractive in uh, late March and early April have rallied pretty hard. And we took advantage of the uh, pullback um, in late March and in early April to become less defensive. And we had been really in the defensive camp for about a year and a half going into this for reasons related to Fed tightening through 2018 and the declining growth rate uh, since June of 2018, which was reflected in declining PMIs, which you referred to. And so we took advantage of that decline because um, uh, the decline in price was so rapid that uh, when the, for example, when the S&P was below 2,400, uh, you probably could have just blindly bought almost anything and made money. And we ran through uh, the numbers on various earnings and, and multiple scenarios, uh, PE scenarios, and we're able to arrive at sort of a theoretical fair value on the market of around 2,800. It of course fell to 2,191, I think was the uh, intraday low. And, uh, you know, everything below 2,400 was a buy. And as you got closer to 2,800, you know, somewhat less enthusiastic. Well, now we're at 3,100 uh, today. And I would say that, uh, well, the cyclical bounce uh, may have some further to run. This market needs to take a time out. Um, this market needs to uh, have a bit of a pullback. It's been the sharpest rally in history, up over 40% now. I think you will get a better chance to enter some of the more cyclical names on a pullback of when that happens. It's uh, of course very hard to think that way when the market's <laughs> up two, 300, 400 points every day, but I can assure you this won't go on uh, forever. So um, I'm sure you can still find some individual cyclical names, whether they be uh, industrial material or, or financial names. Uh, we added to several industrials, or we, started positions in several industrials uh, earlier in, and also into some of the cyclical financials. Uh, but today it's a little bit different. Today I would be price sensitive. I would try to be patient as, as hard as that is. Thank you.
Great. Have you done any work on the potential for online gambling? Um, it's a space that we are very actively looking at. Um, the one, the one thing I would mention, and this is this is true for not just online gambling, but other sort of uh, rapidly emerging industries, is that we take a very uh, concentrated and high conviction portfolio uh, approach to managing the portfolio. So relative to our peer group, uh, the domestic growth fund, for example, has about 40 names. And relative to that peer group, it is relatively concentrated. And so every single, every single name that we put in there, we have to have a lot of conviction in. And the benefit of that is that, you know, we don't have to own everything. And there are certainly a lot of exciting things out there like gambling. Um, but until we are really pulled up on the particular investment thesis on a certain, uh, certain vehicle, we haven't pulled the trigger yet. I'll leave it at that. Uh, is there any economic data that investors should be carefully watching over the next several weeks? Uh, sure. I think um, a couple of things to think about there. Uh, I, I think that the weekly unemployment claims ha has historically been one of the best indicators of where the economy is going. And obviously, they're horrific. they've been horrific, and they need to start improving. They've actually already begun improving, but they, we have a long way to go, and we should see a steady improvement in that with the economy reopening. Um, I would try to focus on a four-week moving average as uh, the week-to-week -week stuff can be a little fluffy, but um, that's a very important measure to look at. If it starts to deteriorate, uh, that would be a, a red flag. And um, so, you know, it's all about jobs right now. We need jobs. We had, uh, you know, one out of four people that, uh, that were working has filed for unemployment. And so... Um, you know, get those jobs back. So yeah, look at, also look at those monthly payroll reports. Of course, with seasonal adjustments, some of those months are a little screwy too. Um, so, you know, finally, those manufacturing PMIs, especially the manufacturing ones, because those really show the beta in the economy, not the service ones. Um, so focus on those. The granddaddy of those is the JP Morgan Global Market, M-A-R-K-I-T, uh, manufacturing PMI. Uh, tends to be a very good indicator of where the global economy is going. Thank you. Um, a question here regarding Facebook um, and Trump's recent attacks of social media companies. Do you have any comments on that? And uh, what would it take you for, for you to dump their stock? Well, we've okay. traded around our Facebook position um, a bit over the last couple of years. And uh, right now, it's probably as, as big as it's ever been. Um, I can actually, you know, I was trying to, I was muted at first, I, oh. I apologize, if you want me to step in, but. Um, Go ahead, Chris, if you want. I was just, I was simply going to say that, uh, you know, the president is um, lashing out at um, what he perceives to be, um, companies uh, or media that are unfriendly to him. And um, frankly, I'm not sure what that's worth in terms of uh, a multiple or earnings. And uh, so it's not really a factor in, in our decision on the stock. But Chris, you want to answer that? For yeah. me? I'll elaborate a little bit because this has been the continuation of a dialogue that has been going on for years. And it's it's the the Trump the executive order specifically addressed something called Section 230, which is it's meant to protect social media platforms from any liability that might present itself in user generated content. And social media platforms remain protected as long as they do not exert editorial influence over content. Um, how, however, uh, social media platforms are also protected under Section. 230 by something called the Good Samaritan blocking, which is essentially the screening or blocking of offenses, offensive material at, at their best judgment. And the courts have been pretty clear that, that Twitter, for example, inserting a get the facts link below Trump tweets, that does not make them liable as a publisher for the rest of their user generated content. So if you ask anybody, any legal expert, um, the executive order 
has no legal grounds uh, whatsoever. That being said, to the bigger point of your question about regulatory scrutiny, um, again, this has been a persistent overhang for the past several years. Uh, the way we think it nets out is that legislative antitrust action is very unlikely right now. Current antitrust law is based on the consumer welfare, welfare standard and historically the telltale sign of harmful monopolistic behavior was rising consumer prices. And of course, as we all know, the major tech platforms of the day all pride themselves on lowering prices or in other cases being free to use. And those platforms can also make a very strong case that they serve as a foundation and infrastructure for millions of small businesses, which is true. Um, that being said, they are aggregators who have commoditized suppliers to a degree never seen before simply because of the zero distribution cost of the internet. But the risk of antitrust breakup um, decreased significantly once Sanders and Warren dropped out of the race. Biden has not really had a clear stance on this subject. And even if antitrust law uh, were to be pursued, to be changed, it would be a multi-year process. On the other side, uh, you have potential for more regulatory scrutiny. That's much more likely, and that probably will happen. But on regulation, if you look at how GDPR has played out in Europe, for example, it is further evidence that regulation tends to entrench incumbents who are the only ones with the resources to meet compliance. But at the end of the day, with regard to how it affects the multiple, we think all of this is very baked into the stocks. And we don't think Facebook ever trades at 35 times earnings again. Um, but that being said, we, we, still, we still like the valuation where it is. And Chris, I would just, one quick final point on that was going back to 2018, when a lot of the regulatory concern first surfaced, there was the, the concern that the uh, Facebook audience was leaving for privacy reasons and that the advertisers would follow. Neither of those things happened. Uh, Facebook's eyeballs have continued to grow across their various platforms, and the advertising has continued to grow very nicely. And of course, during this work from home, remote world we're living in today, those uh, particular uh, trends have, uh, have accelerated. And then, I, not that we need to add any more to the answer to this question, but of course, as, as the China tensions seem to be re-escalating, um, I think the US, will eventually come to view our tech platforms as competitive sources of strength that they don't want to, they don't want to restrict too much at this point. Great. A couple more here quickly. How much of a premium should we be paying now for some of these growth names looking at their current levels pulled forward to the end of 2021? Well, I can, um, it's, it's hard to answer that question without getting specific on a name, but I can talk about valuations more generally because, um, because I definitely empathize with those who are wary of growth valuations. And in the bull case, as we talked about already a little bit, the bull case for growth stocks maintaining this valuation spread relative to value, that bull case is based on scarcity of growth, but also historically low discount rates, which justify higher multiples, all else being equal. Um, but even if you believe that because of the low growth, low rate environment, even if you believe those higher multiples are justified, it still feels like these stocks have re-rated somewhat unchallenged without much of a price discovery process. And that may or may not be coming, um, but also because lower discount rates justify valuations for companies with little or no free cash flow. If that's the kind of thing that makes you nervous, I, I would just say that part of our investment process is emphasizing companies with strong unit economics, strong free cash flow. The, the one exception in our portfolio off the top of my head might be Netflix, but that's a situation where we see a very clear line of sight to positive free cash flow. Um, so again, it's hard to tell you what multiple to pay without talking about a specific stock, but I would focus on quality margins, unit economics. And uh, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, Chris, that when you're growing at 20, 30, 40, 45 percent, um, provided, of course, that that doesn't uh, get interrupted suddenly, you tend to grow into your valuation uh, over a, a very acceptable period of time. And we've seen that happen 
uh, time and time again. And on your comment on free cash flow, um, let's just talk, let me just talk about Amazon for one moment. The, uh, you know, Amazon is a stock that for many years, a lot of investors would refuse to invest in because whatever valuation metric they were looking at, it wasn't low enough. And of course, Jeff Bezos has become the richest person in the world by foregoing short-term profits, you know, to manage his company for the long haul. He continues to do that. They continue to grow uh, market share, uh, revenues, earnings, free cash flow. It's a long way of getting to the point that I really want to make, which is that over the next two to three years, the free cash flow of Microsoft is going to explode. And um, so we've you know, been waiting a long time to get more and more free cash flow from Microsoft. And we're now at a point where um, the, the waterfall is about to begin. So thank you. Great. Well, Howard and Chris, we greatly appreciate your time today. And we'd like to thank everyone for joining the webcast. Uh, we will make the slides available after. Um, but if you have any questions regarding the presentation or strategies or would like a replay of today's presentation, you can contact your investment representative or call 1-800-422-2274 or email us at advisor at gabelli.com. Once again, we'd like to thank you for joining the webcast and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Investors should carefully consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the fund before investing. The prospectus, which contains more complete information about this and other matters, should be read carefully before investing. To obtain a prospectus, please call 1-800-GABELLI or visit www.gabelli.com.